And for the agenda today, we're going to go through first the serious game definition in history, uh, because in order to analyze something, we have to first know what it is. So that's why we're going back to the definition. And uh, we're going to take a look at the history to see how the analysis process as well as the industry improved throughout the decades. Uh, secondly, uh, we're going to talk about uh, some kind of, uh, different types of games and in order for you to not confuse it with serious game and uh, yeah. Um, and then um, we're going to talk about serious game of tools and uh, which we will deeper into point two here. And uh, in this section, the authors of the first book, the first chapter of the book that I give the link to you on GitLab, they actually inject a purpose into the definition of serious game. So we're not going to see how it goes. And fourth, we're going to talk about different types of analytics that are related to serious game, like learning analytics and game analytics. Finally, it's the paper analysis. All right. And let's get started by looking at the definition and history of serious game. Serious game has many definitions. Uh, and we look at a bunch of papers, uh, but the most widely uh, accepted definition out there is probably uh, the one that says anything, any game that have a purpose beyond uh, entertainment is considered a serious game. So if you can see the three definitions that I listed on the slide here, they all have the same common definition, which is not uh, entertainment games are classified as serious game. However, there's still no universally accepted definition is this. So uh, some of the definition that I went through, it actually say that the game is characterized by the player and not the, the creator itself. So some, in some situation, like if the player actually learns something from the game and then, then they can actually call it a serious game or not, it depends. But uh, yeah, this is the widely accepted um, definition for now. So digital game, we have digital game here and we look at the purpose of it. If it's created primarily, mainly for enjoyment, then it's a t an entertainment games. And if not, then it's a serious game. And we just stop at that. Um, yep, and this, uh, now we go into the history of serious game up to the 90s. Uh, the first serious game there is, is probably Oregon Trail. Uh, in this game, the player assumed the role of a wagon leader, uh, guiding a party of settlers from Independence, Missouri, to Oregon's Willamette Valley via a covered wagon in 1848. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this deeper because well, uh, I think we talked about it in a bunch of previous uh, lecture already. Um, the second one is Max Strat, which is graded between somewhere between 1974 and 1977 by Gian Claude Laurenti and Professor Hubert Gattinen. In this game, the player run a virtual company. This game is first published and used at the INSEED Euro Campus, a French business school, business school. And this game is has actually become very popular. That they've been further perfected the game over the years and its latest version is now present in most business schools in the world. We can probably take a look at the, they actually have a um, video here to actually uh, marketize, marketing the game. Uh, I'm just gonna play it. Can you see the, oh wait, can anyone hear the video, the, the sound of the video? I audio? I can't. No, I don't think so either. Uh, let me see if I can show are you. The... Are you playing it actually, or is it just on pause right now? If you. Just yeah, it's pause. Mm, okay, let me just keep playing and see. Yeah. Can you hear? I think, why are your microphone or something like this? It feels like. 
It's a very, 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 the, very. I can just turn video. on the subtitle there, and you don't have to hear it. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, and that's about it. Uh, if you just just a short it. just a short mm -hmm. remark. I think that if you were to play back with audio, I think there is a somewhere there should be a button say share audio. I think on share sound, share the audio on your control. Let me see. Uh, oh, share computer sound. The oldest challenge is in education. Anyone How it works, yeah. To engage okay. in class. Okay, next one. <laughs> so then we know how to do it. Yep. Okay, and um, that's the uh, one of the game. That is created in the 80s. And yeah, you can see now the latest version is used in more than, not that, in more than 500 universities worldwide, uh, which is quite cool. And uh, in the 80s, as well, uh, the, as the computer pay based uh, instruction became popular, the events of altering software, such as AutoWare, Adobe Director, and Flash, uh, led to the possibility to, no, the ability to create games. Um, so teachers can actually use this tool to create their own game for instruction. And sometimes these games are used to teach specific subjects or skill. Uh, and other times they could be used to illustrate like uh, difficult concepts or procedures. Um, but within this uh, period, there is little to no need to analyze the serious game effect on learner's performance because um, as long as this game was for show and tell, like, um, it's just like to give the, the knowledge out there. They don't really care about measuring the effect because they have other means to assess the student learning in their classroom, for example, tests, quiz and exam and such. So there was really no uh, serious game analysis at this phase. And uh, in the late 80s, um, the, with the explosive boom of the laser video game, uh, such as the release of uh, Game Boy and Wii console, the game and it's, uh, the entertainment game industry was fueled by enormous, enormous investment, which left the educational game behind because they were mostly only used for I think they only support PC at that, at that time, and there was no support for the new coming out console as long as they could, couldn't compete with the uh, entertainment game industry. And the serious game industry, I think, is going there, uh, just been in the slump for uh, 10 years, and which leads us to the 80s, wait, the 90s. And this yeah. is not my part, so Andrew. <laughs> Well, I'll talk about serious games in the 90s. Um, we had the edutain edutainment era, and it started with the success of the old educational games, as already presented. And people liked the, liked the idea, and it was kind of a new, it was a big boom at the time. Uh, it was consisting of mixing education and entertainment together. 
but they had a big trauma event because some companies started rushing. They rushed to release poorly designed games for profit and they kind of flooded the market with these poorly designed games. And this is the big trauma of this era. Um, well, learning, learning gamification consists in animations like sounds, bright colors, challenges, entertain, entertaining, challenges, uh, entertaining and motivating with uh, game elements. Um, yeah, one aspect of the fall was the drill and kill games, which is basically like uh, the repetition, uh, that's the drill part that you are constantly seeing the same thing in the game and it's repetitive. And kill that, uh, this kind of uh, process was not, uh, was killing the creativity of the learners. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. Yes, so um, for the serious game history from the like 2000 and up until now, um, we can first look back to 2002 when two major events happened in the serious game industry. The first of which was the release of probably among the first proper studies on how to better the education of serious games in the paper Serious Games Improving Public Policy Through Game-Based Learning and Simulation by Sawyer and Rajeski. And then the second one was the development of America's Army by the US military, um, which was a war game commissioned by the US military that uh, was described as engaging, informative, and entertaining, and was primarily used for, uh, for uh, informing people about the US uh, Army and uh, the jobs there, so it's almost like uh, an advertisement for it. Um, but it also served as a way to train the different soldiers uh, in the field operations. Um, and it happened to be quite popular as there were 42.6 million downloads. Um, yeah, uh, and it earned many accolades for its design. Then uh, after those two events, uh, there was the formation of the Games of Health and the Games for Change, uh, which was in around 2014. Um, this, uh, along with the fact that the FBI and the US Homeland Security was starting to get really interested in serious game to facilitate training and uh, uh, public awareness, uh, served as a spark for the private industry to more seriously consider serious games, uh, which is how 25% uh, of uh, global Fortune 500 companies use serious games in some format, whether it's uh, training or onboarding people onto their own systems. And um, this is also seen in the uh, estimated market valuation of $5.4 billion as of 2020, uh, and this is going to continue to rise as it has a compounded annual growth rate of 19.2, which is very high. Um, this shows how uh, the events of more established uh, established uh, groups like uh, FBI and US and uh, the paper from Sawyer and Rajeski uh, really, really gave some interest in serious games and how it can be actually applied. And that is where we are now. You can go to the next slide. All right, now we're going to the next part. Serious game is not for entertainment. And the first thing we want to talk about is Message Broadcaster. So what is Message Broadcaster? It is a non-entertainment or serious game created with the purpose of broadcasting a certain message through one-way communication. And according to a research of Alvarez and colleagues in 2011, 
this kind of game takes up to 90% of the serious game that uh, has been created. And um, one of the example of this kind of game is Tennis for Two, which is created in 1958 by William Higginbotham. He's an American nuclear physicist working at the Brookhaven National Laboratory. And um, in in uh, this in this period, it was the Cold War um, period in the America, I think. So uh, the general public was not really at ease with the scientific research, especially with the laboratory working on nuclear projects. So um, in order to reassure the neighboring population, the laboratory decided to organize guided tour. And um, this guy, uh, uh, what's his name again? Uh, William, he found out that these tours are actually quite boring. So this is why he created this, this game uh, to, in order to uh, increase the uh, I don't know, engagement of this, this kind of tours. Um, and this, uh, this, this is the gameplay. And this game is created with the sole purpose to broadcast a reassuring message to the civilian living near the nuclear research laboratory. So if we to stick to the definition of serious game, so any game is not created mainly for entertainment. It's a serious game, then this game suddenly fit into the category. But it doesn't really uh, give, the, give the player any useful information, how we can say that. And um, another game is Captain Novelin. This is a game designed to teach kids about how to manage diabetes. And this game lets you play as a diabetic superhero who must take care of the glucose level in the blood while, be, while defeating evil junk food alien. Um, uh, and this is a gameplay of the game. Okay, so um, you can choose language and then it has a warning screen where it tells you this game doesn't really tell you how to manage your diabetes and your doctor will tell you exactly how you should be doing in your case specifically. And then this game, um, the blue post in your blood. And they give you like uh, what you should be eating for breakfast and lunch and lunch. Uh, it's different levels. Uh, and then you kind of go around and collecting all of the thing. And um, at the beginning of the game, I think at the beginning of every level, it will have a message to show you uh, knowledge of what about uh, diabetes, I guess. And then you just kind of go around avoiding junk food and collecting healthy food. And that's a quiz about the message at the beginning. Yeah, so that's about it. Uh, Lund, sir, game, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Lund. Could you lower yeah. the volume of your uh, video playback? Because it's very, very, very loud here. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the, that is another game in the message broadcaster category because in this game, they does not really uh, present any extremely accurate information 
um, some of the theory like um, because like when you adjusting your glucose level injecting your insulin or whatever it's not an exact amount of what you should be so if this game is I mean if some child who doesn't read the first screen then they will have a problem in it and um, but as far as the game goes uh, there's actually um, research uh, to measure this game effectiveness uh, not for this one but uh, the game is Pecky and Marlon which is similar to this game but uh, it's a two-player mode and the group of, child, of children who were presented with this game was observed to be better at managing their diabetes or not and the number of the case was the children the number of cases where these children had to go to the hospital due to a glucose crisis decreased by 77 percent compared with the group who didn't play the game so as you can see like even though it, even though it's a message broadcaster game there's still things that the children can learn from it so it's kind of a black uh, vague border between uh, message broadcaster and what's not I guess, and it's, as you can see in figure two here, uh, yeah, Ares yeah, uh, and his colleague uh, research have formed like an extension to what the original definition of serious game could be. So, and they separated into message broadcaster and serious game for skill improvement in training. And the main question is that does it have an assessment component? If it doesn't have one, then it's a message broadcaster. And if it do have one, it does have one, then it will be for serious game for skill and improvement. Um, then the question here is what kind of characteristic do we expect from a serious game? Well, according to the National Submit on Educational Games, these are the following attributes that are important for game-based learning, or in other words, a serious game. First, it must have a clear goal, a repeatable task to build mastery, and it must have some kind of uh, money, some kind of um, features, functions, uh, how do you say it, to monitor the learner's process, also encourage increase time on tasks through motivation and adjust the learning difficulty level to match the learner's level of mastery. So for example, you can choose between, for example, easy levels, medium uh, difficulty or extremely difficulty within the game. And okay, continue. Andre? Yeah, uh, game, uh, so the gamification is not a, it's not a game and it is the process that uses game mechanics uh, or game features uh, out of game environments for motivating and it could be used for multiple purposes. Um, there are some expectations in the future uh, about e-learning, you could use some gamification aspects but there is still a trauma, don't know if you remember, from the 90s, from the flooded uh, by the, those drill and kill games. So they are always one step back. They are, they are concerned a bit about the use of gamification as well. You can go to the next slide. Uh, yes, so digital game-based learning. Um, it is a very muddled term, term uh, as mentioned by the authors of the paper. Um, it's a term that uh, was popularized uh, by Mark Prensky and James P.G. Um, it um, is a bit of an umbrella term where, like uh, mentioned previously, it seems to encompass all the different uh, types of serious games from message broadcasting to proper serious games, uh, edutainment and educational games, but it's just not uh, entertainment games. Um, and this 
seems to be a bit conflicting with what uh, what we might believe serious games are, where they have a better chance of um, of uh, of uh, teaching the player something so that they can uh, learn. Um, and it's also a matter that here, uh, uh, digital game-based learning has a way of uh, being a bit confusing as people have different notions of what a game really is, um, which is why some of the authors uh, seem to be implying that serious games and digital game-based learning should possibly be a bit uh, separate with serious games having some injected purpose to it. Uh, while digital game-based learning is more of a broad general term. Um, what sets the uh, digital game-based learning apart from other contemporary models are primarily the fact that it is a game which allows for immediate feedback, uh, such as a person losing a life, uh, some remote telemetry so that they can get in situ data, and that it has an assessment component where the user is uh, graded based on the, uh, on the data that's collected during the gameplay. Um, but there is an issue with the digital game-based learning and that is that there is a lack of evidence of benefits for it. Um, this stems from uh, uh, media comparison studies, which uh, was a flawed study, which we'll, we'll talk about uh, a bit later, which uh, seemed to um, imply that it wasn't as effective. Um, the flawed flaws that came with this was that um, it's difficult to compare effectiveness of different media at uh, promoting educational outcomes. Um, Particularly, the authors note that there is a conflation or a mixing between media and method. Those two terms should be separate according to them. Um, but media comparison studies were debunked by Salomon and Clark uh, from a paper they wrote uh, many years ago, um, which then kind of left a void, which means there is not that much framework when it comes to analyzing serious games and their effectiveness, which is why there is a need for new types of analysis, which uh, we will talk about a little bit later. Next slide. Okay, now we're moving on to the serious game it's tall part. And the first is we're going to talk about games for skill and human performance improvement. So here the authors of the paper, they inject uh, primary purpose to the serious game definition. So if I quote them here, then serious game are digital games and simulation tools that are created for non-entertainment use. That's the first, uh, the original one, but then they inject, but with the primary purpose to improve skills and performance of play learners through training and instructions. And uh, now that the, there's a study that is, and now the researchers are starting to use uh, game serious game as testing and assessment tool, then there's a need to really clearly define the term performance here in order to uh, correctly use it inside research. And according to them, the performance term should include work learning performance and just not stop short at the knowledge acquisition uh, space, which is a resemblance of the drill and kill entertainment approach in the in the nineties, which we want definitely want to avoid. Um, and also, there's a question between balance in the balance between testing and training when using games as test. So, for example, how much the time should be spent on the game before doing the testing? Uh, these questions are could be uh, answers by game analysis and such. And um, the authors say that by injecting 
human performance improvement back into the definition of serious game, we actually created more problem. Is some of them is that how do we differentiate this type of game from the message broadcaster? As you can see um, in my slide about message broadcaster before, it's kind of like a very thin border between message broadcaster and a serious game. And there should there be a new game, uh, a new name for this kind of performance improving game. Some people classify this kind of game as training games compared to others. Um, to other mess, uh, message broadcasting and information disseminating games. Uh, as you can see in figure three, the difference among entertainment game, message broadcaster and serious game is that message broadcaster is like kind of both entertainment game and serious game. So it's kind of like a gray area here. And Finally, what do we get by casting serious game as a tool to improve skill and performance and not including message broadcaster in there? Uh, and by doing this, we actually gonna have the ground for serious game analytics. Um, so if we say a game is serious game, then we can proceed to analyze it by measuring its effect on how much it can improve the play learners working or learning performance instead of just saying, okay, this game is not uh, for graded for entertainment. So, okay, yes, uh, and it's a serious game. Okay, so now how do we actually go about and um, measure it to analyze it? It's kind of like a very broad and very broad term to define uh, this category of game. And then the need for stealth like approach assessment will be eliminated as we uh, style like approach assessment is preferring to the user not being fully performed, informed about what kind and how much gameplay data were being collected. Uh, this approach was taken a few years ago, but now I think there's a whole new law that prevents uh, this kind of thing. So by, by having a purpose to serious game, we can actually uh, avoid the need of using this kind of approach to measure the game. Okay. Yeah, cool. Yes, so datification is, uh, according to Cookier and Meyer, uh, they define datification as the conversion of all aspects of life into data, uh, specifically quantitative data. So anything from uh, how many steps you took today, the calories you eat, uh, how many hours you slept, uh, things like that. Um, and with the recent rise of phones from like, mid 2000s to today, um, identification is pretty much universal, which, uh, or, uh, which means that there is data collection at an unprecedented scale. And uh, this data analysis, uh, or for serious games, uh, data analysis is a very key point that uh, is necessary for, uh, analyzing how effective it might be and how to properly run the different systems within this series scheme. Um, the, uh, the, previously, there was a need for either the company to use, to buy some uh, already pre-made data or to pay users to uh, play their game or to collect their data. Uh, nowadays, there is uh, an excessive amount of it, which means uh, the pace of growth within uh, serious games is uh, quite big in that sense, um, because they can make all sorts of improvements to the different analytics. Yes? So uh, I'll talk about gameplay data and data collection. 
and it's consisting in-game data collection is getting in-game actions digitally converted into variables and variables that have some value for our analysis and we can get some behavior uh, out of repeated events so if we see that the variable is repeating it could be con it could be considered behavior and we had some problems in the past with collecting data from uh, players in the past uh, it was very first of all it was very costly uh, to implement and difficult to execute because it required uh, strong analytical skills and experiences experience they have a lot of privacy laws especially in the usa but things have changed and people are not very concerned about game uh, about uh, gameplay data they like they are more sociable with collecting them about a uh, gameplay about games can you go to the next thing so there are how to collect data uh, there is like uh, the in situ data collection which it's not very common in researchers because it's harder to implement and it has to be taught bef before uh, and while you program the game like because uh, it uses uh, data in, within the system so the data is collected while you are playing the game and some some variables represent what play learners actually do in the game environment and ways to collect there are some data dump as log data game telem telemetry which i can talk about and there is some information trails as well so it's hard to find a real also uh, some trivia <laughs> it's a bit hard to find a real in situ because most analysis are made postdoc in a ex situ environment. So a real in situ would be you collect uh, while the player is playing in the game and you, you analyze while the player is still playing the game. But, uh, but uh, this would be the analysis in situ and the data collection in situ. So there are some advantages of using the in-situ data collection, which are uh, assessment uh, while game is in progress. This is the biggest advantage. Can you go to the next one? And the ex-situ data collection, it's the most common and easier way to do it. It, it is, uh, the data collection is, is done uh, outside the system after the, the feature, usually, the, the, the play, usually. And the uh, common way it's like survey uh, is through survey data, um, pretest, protest, talk aloud, and interviews. Can you go to the next one? Uh, I will talk about uh, major comparison. I think it, it's a bit not. Uh, it's a way to compare to. Uh, it's an exit to data. Called, uh, Data collection, when you you compare two media, media comparison institute and you compare two, uh, the relative effectiveness, effectiveness of different media at promoting educational outcomes. Uh, it's often showed no statistical, statistical significance by Clark and uh, study, and it's uh, hard to compare. This research method is flawed, flawed. Uh, and should be avoided at all costs in serious game researches. Yeah, you can go to next one. There is the pretest protest validity, which is the most common methodology to analyze to get some data from serious game to analyze the data. And we uh, the, there are some problems with it with uh, the external validity issues because. Some players cannot uh, be quarantined uh, for the, the time that is required. Usually, the sessions take like take um, five to thirty minutes only. But he states that uh, some games should take days or if not months to complete. 
And also there are some problems with the, they can share uh, when they leave the environment, they can share some information that could uh, influence in, uh, the experiment. Can you do it? The walkthrough. Well, talk at all and self-reports. It's when um, participants will talk and like describe their experience. And particip participants tend to report, uh, that's a problem that participants tend to report what they think the researchers want to them to say. So it's, it can influence and be a issue for the validity of the uh, experiment. So researchers need to be con also con conscious as, as to how they design the AV test because it could easily fall into the trap of media comparison. And I already stated that the, this should be avoided for the serious game analysis. And we need, we need a uh, better ways to evaluate and assess uh, the learning performance of serious games. Well, we... Uh, do uh, you want to start something? No, it's about this one, but you can talk the type of, of analysis. Okay. Okay, you can start because you got the first one. Okay, so we will present some, we divided into three types of analysis. Uh, learning analytics and uh, game. Uh, wait a second, I forgot the name. It's game analytics and serious game analytics. And because the concept of uh, serious game analytics is different, it should be taken as different in some aspects. So we'll go through each one of the analytics, the ways of analyzing. So learning, learning analytics. And I chose a paper, it was about, um, it's a literature review of learning analytics into higher education. And it usually talks about uh, what is happening right now in the research field and, and what is the evidence of learning analytics research working. And they searched for 252 research papers and uh, the research approaches were me methods of data collection, methods of data analysis, and uh, research evidence in the f and research evidence in the field of uh, learning analytics. Well, the, can you go to the next one? Yeah. Well, this paper is it's uh, I chose them. I chose this one because it was a big overview of the learning analytics. But it goes. It's it's most it's mostly about uh, describing what is happening in, right now in the research field. So it will be a lot of uh, numbers and just how, how things are done now and what is the tendency. So, yeah. So research approaches. Research approaches, there's the descriptive one, which describes a phenomenon uh, in a, a, a appearance without any use of theory. There's the philosophical, which reflects upon the phenomenon without data and any any use of theory. That's the theoretical, which reflects on the phenomenon based on some theory, but without empirical data. There's the theory one, theory you use, which applies the theory or theories uh, or models as a framework for the conducted study. There is the theory gener generation, ge generating, which analyzes data in a syst systematic manner with a purpose of building the theory. And there, and there is the theory testing, which they test the theory using data in a systematic manner. So uh, the, the 252, 252 papers, they got the, that 50, 57% of the articles use research approaches, research approaches with a descriptive research, 26% with theory use and use research, 11% with theory generation, 5% with philosophical, and 2% with theoretical. Um, can you go to the next one? Okay, uh, so, so methods of data collection. Again, a lot of uh, descriptive things of these methods of data collection. There is the argument, uh, it's a logical argument, but not based on in any particular theory or relating explicitly or by clear implications to any theory. 
this it, it, you know, ethnography and any attempt to, under, to understand actions by systematic observation in a inter, interpretation. There's the experiment, uh, one second, uh, experiment, field and quasi experiment included. This category applies to systematic slash structured tests, even though, uh, even to the, even though in fields, uh, in field settings, many environment environment variables clearly are not co co controlled, and tests may be rather explorative. There is interpretative, uh, any kind of data collection collection more strictly perform, performed than a case study, case story, sorry, um, but not necessarily a strictly explained or descriptive method for in, inter, interpretation. Case study belongs here, um, as do more limited study uh, where qualitative and quantitative data is used. Studies that use data from large data sets, example, LMS, uh, for the purpose of interpreting the studied phenomenon. So literature is, literature is study. On, only documents on documents used, not necessarily a strict method of even ex, or, or even explicit, explicitly labeled as literature study. Products description. IT product method or, or method or similar described by the manufacturer or, or someone else. Survey. This includes qualitative or overviews of several documents and uh, case, cases as well. And unclear, even though widely uh, defined the categories are both, uh, fail to capture the, this method. Okay, so in method of data collection, 68% of the studies use interpretative data collection, um, product, product, uh, met, pr product description method, uh, such as interview or focus groups. 18% use experiments, 15% use product description, and 11% use survey. So, can you go to no methods? Oh yeah, you are Methods of data analysis. Okay, so there, <laughs> there is prediction, clustering, uh, relationship mining, relationship mining, uh, distillation of data, for human judgment discovery with methods. So prediction is a major task tech tackled by prediction predict, prediction methods it is to predict performances student, of students. The most common methods include regression and classific, classification. Clustering, clustering techniques are used uh, to, to group objects so that similar objects are in the same cluster and dissimilate objects are in different clusters. Relationship mining, uh, this category includes such methods as asso asso association rule mining, correlation mining, sequential pattern mining, and casual data mining. Um, distillation of data human judgment, this category includes stati statistics and visualization that help humans make sense of their finding and analysis. So discovery with models, uh, and this category encompasses approaches in in which uh, the model obtained is a in a previous study is included in the data to discover more patterns. patterns. So, uh, well, there are some the predictive methods from the total number of predictive methods are represent thirty two percent. Relationship mining, twenty-four percent. Distillation of data of of data for of for human judgment, twenty-four percent. Discovery with, with models approaches, fifteen percent, and cluster techniques, fifteen oh, eleven percent. Uh, the predictive methods decreased from for twenty sixteen from twenty percent and twenty seventeen uh, of fifteen percent compared to. 214 with 47% and 2015 with 56%. Oh yeah, oh, 40%. Uh, for, they had 48% for 2018, but it does not illustrate uh, the whole picture because the sample of this year was limited. Okay, can we, yeah. So evidence of uh, learning assistant research. 
uh, we, they used uh, four propositions from Ferguson Clow work and pro propositions, sorry. And they, there are basically four questions that they answer with yes, no, and potentially. And they represent uh, the learning, the how the learning, is, uh, learning, is, learning analysis is presented in those aspects in the higher education. So uh, the questions were uh, learning analytics improve learning outcomes, yes or no, or probably potentially. And learning analytics uh, improve uh, learning support and teaching, including retention, com 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 completion, and progression. And learning analytics are token up uh, and used wide widely, including the deployments at scale. And learning analytics are used in an ethical way. Can you go to the next one? So about those numbers, uh, only 35% of learning analytics improve learning support. And uh, I mean, this is what they classified them as only 35% of the learning analytics improve learning and support and teaching in higher education. 9% improve students learning outcome only. And 6% of the learning analytics of the, 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 the articles say that learn, they classified as learning analytics are taken up and used widely. 80% of the research studies uh, even mention ethics or privacy. And this, they have, I put this picture there, this graph, just to show you how badly, the, especially the graphs are made in this, this, this project, because there is no subtitles, like I don't know what the gray one is, what the, strong gray, gray one is so the, the images were completely di randomly distributed through the article and they have no nothing written so the images are not very good can you go to the next one so uh, learning analytics uh, they study results that uh, that provide some evidence of implementing of learning outcome focus mainly in three areas there's the knowledge acquisition, including in improved assessment, marks, and better grades, academic performance. Um, yeah. Um, there's the skill development, which advances in, st in students' time management, <coughs> advances, advances in students' time management, skills, uh, preparation skills, reflections, and co collaborative problem solving skills were accepted. And there is the cognitive case, which is thinking and re reasoning. Um, do learning analytics improve learning support and teaching? Only 35% have an overall potential. Uh, I'm sorry, over, all, only 35% they classified as yes, but they see an overall potential to improve to 62%. So what, what, should, what should transfer this potential into practice? Can you go to the next one? I mean, this is an open question. Uh, conclusion. Uh, there is, it's, they conclude that this is a really new field and it's maturing. And so they have some, yeah, the data analysis. Uh, learning assistant researches in higher education is shifting from prediction, uh, for example, retention and, and grades towards a deeper understanding of the student's learning experience. 9% uh, uh, have a clear evidence of uh, improvement of in learning outcomes. And systematic and detailed literature, oh yeah, and they consider this work as a systematic and a detailed literature review for learning analytics in higher education. Uh, they also consider this work a good starting point to uh, for, for researchers interested in the field of uh, learning analytics. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a big compilation of uh, what is happening now, what, uh, which techniques are they using now and for learning analytics for higher education and what they expect to, to be in the future. That's it, which technically, techniques they use and that's it. Yes, so um, then we move on to game analytics. This is 
any sort of analytics that is uh, used for uh, video games made for uh, entertainment or I guess some board games as well. Um, so the primary focus of these is naturally to entertain the user. Um, and in order to optimize this, uh, there is three different types of metrics that uh, game analytics employs typically. First of which is uh, user metrics, uh, which me measures a different sort of uh, attributes of players in game behavior. Um, this can be anything from uh, how long they play, uh, how many friends they have, how much damage they deal in a given round, uh, anything like that. Um, then there's performance metrics, which monitors the software-based infrastructure of the different games. So if you can imagine uh, an online game which has servers need uh, some form of optimization and analytics to uh, run properly. Then there is process metrics, which is the, uh, the way that you can optimize the development of different games. Um, for these three different types of uh, metrics, there's um, we only really need uh, user metrics and performance metrics uh, when it comes to uh, uh, serious games. Uh, so, well, typically serious games haven't been too big in a scope to require any form of major performance. Um, that might uh, be changing in the future, but uh, for the time being, it doesn't seem like it's um, much of a need. Um, but user metrics is the main driving factor of, of uh, why we are consider why game analytics would be considered for uh, serious games analytics. Um, the problem with this is that the different um, the different points of uh, positive and negative uh, reactions uh, are often very, very closely guarded by the different companies as it's the backbone of their multi-million dollar games. Um, and in addition to this, it's also highly tailored to different genres of games, which is why it might uh, not be the most viable for game analytics as uh, uh, the audience might be different. It might be more generic audience or more targeted. Um, so this, these are two examples of why it falls short. But in addition to this, there is the fact that the primary focus of the vast majority of uh, game analytics is to increase revenue for the uh, company. Um, having the user actually enjoy the game is typically a, uh, it's just a way to increase the revenue. But if they can get away with uh, increasing revenue without uh, increasing the user enjoyment, then that is often very acceptable to them, which is why game analytics is often inherently manipulative and it can employ different uh, designs such as the Skinner box design, which is a famous um, method for keeping players playing even longer than they usually would have by by randomizing output of any given action. So uh, instead of rewarding the player every time it does a specific task, it might reward them every 50% of the time, which tends to then increase the play time. Uh, now that doesn't necessarily increase enjoyment, it just means that there it gives the company more opportunities to increase their revenue by um, First of all, gathering more data on them since they're in the game longer, but also presenting them different uh, different opportunities to buy things through microtransactions or DLCs or anything uh, like that. Um, these are reasons why game analytics might fall a bit short for serious game analytics, but it's still a very useful tool to consider when uh, serious games analytics is 
or properly defined, which is the next topic. Uh, so now we come to the question is whether game analytics plus learning analytics equals to serious game analytics. Well, is the answer is quite, well, yes and no. Well, yes is quite obvious because like there's some common metrics in learning analytics that serious game can use. And there's also some common metrics in game analytics where serious game can use as well. So these metrics can use some general analytics for all of the industries uh, that we listed. So for these, for example, can be the time of completion, length of access, and etc. Um, for the nodes, why is not? Uh, then the reason is that learning analytics and game analytics are from distinctly different industries as well as serious game analytics. So therefore we, they measure different things and insights are not complete because the metrics are not conceptualized optimally for a serious game as well. So if you consider this question, for example, why should a game develop, why should game developers and publishers make use of learning analytics to improve their game designs or uh, to improve sales at all? There's no reason to use it, right? And then we researchers and teachers from the learning analytics communities consider game analytics for learning improvement? Uh, this question might be, uh, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but for into further explaining this, the no point, we want to analytics differ by origin and purpose. So if we look at the learning analytics purpose, is to understanding and optimizing learning and the environment in which it occurs uh, and improve learning and relearning learning related aspects like for example learning outcomes um, learning environments etc for game analytics is mostly to improve gameplay and in make the game more enjoy enjoyable to the players in order to well boost sale uh, but for our serious game analytics we actually aim at different things such as obtain actionable, valuable actionable insight to better the game or learning design and improve the skill and performance of the play learners to better convince the stakeholder that this game is effective to use in this context in order to train the players or whatever. And if you look at the figure uh, here, then you can see that game analytics is actually going up to the going like to the vertical direction to increase enjoyment and fun by this, by having better gameplay and better design. Um, while serious game analytics go into more like a horizontal uh, direction to towards the human performance improvement here. So the aim is to improve the game design in order to improve the skill and the performance of human in general. So since the other three analytics are based on different metrics, criteria and purposes, there's no reason to assume the performance metrics for one industry would work or transfer well into another. Um, so like, as you can see in the slide, the previous slides, they, they even still have questions in whether they should redefine serious game at all. So when it comes to analytics, it's, us, it's at this time, I think it's still like a very open questions waiting for answers. Um, and there's a lot of um, proposed methods for this, but uh, until there's better evidence uh, available that uh, learning analytics and game analytics can be transferred on into um, serious game analytics um, that this field re remained um, unfinished, I guess. And that's conclude our first part of the presentation. Any questions? Mostly comments at this stage. Um, so, um, as far, uh, I of course, leave the floor to others uh, in a second. Uh, just uh, some th thoughts. You pretty much gave a rundown of the entire serious games concept again. 
uh, which is good. Um, um, uh, but uh, you, I think uh, you did a good job in actually crystallizing out the uh, the highlights. You know what what we actually want to get at. Are there generalizable analytics for for games or analyzing metrics that we could apply for analytics um, uh, and borrowed from games uh, into serious games? And I think you gave a se seemingly conclusive answers. But uh, did you find any reference to some um, general listing, perhaps even by industry? Um, that looks at the nature of metrics applied in serious games, like because you said, okay, we, you know, there's, it's really hard to um, have some sort of transferability between industries, but is there really none? Well, there is some which uh, we will present in the there's a paper analysis after this, and we pick one of the method that is um, proposed by the authors, and they actually combine learning analytics and game analytics with into uh, analyze a serious game so there is but there's quite a few of them and uh, most of them and I think there's not enough to actually draw a conclusion there so. mm, okay right is there any other questions from the from the audience from the participants I, I'm not sure if most of them are still uh, actively around because it was it was a fairly extensive talk I think the most extensive talk we had so far so which is uh, um, well prepared indeed um, so yeah as far as I'm concerned I'm good I'm not sure if anyone is else there else I would suggest that we take a break for until uh, um, um, 1 30 right for seven minutes or so because you still have a paper you want to briefly discuss or we want to briefly discuss right mm -hmm. so is yeah. that okay with everyone or do you need longer? For me, it's good. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's uh, reconvene in, in in seven minutes then. Cool. Sounds good. Thank you very much for now. Um, quite a, a great effort on all uh, of you and good coordination. Thank you very much. See you in a few minutes. Yeah.
we do start. Uh, I don't know. Is everybody back? I, I, have a, I have a suggestion before we get going, and that is to see if everybody uh, knows how to use the, the interfaces. I mean, uh, can everybody uh, push the yes button to see that they... Oh, there you go. Three yeses. Four, five, some half of you know how to push the yes button. There were more. What about the thumbs up? Like? Perfect, perfect. That means that, uh, do you see this uh, as well as you present? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, that way you can interact with the audience if you want. You can ask a question, yes, no question, or you can ask if there's everybody's happy with what you do, and then a little bit of interaction. I think that, that should be good. Nice. Now we can turn the thumbs off. Okay, yes, yes, almost everyone. Yeah, looks good. Yes, yeah, so we're gonna start on the next part. In this paper we're going to present is about a methodology to assess the effectiveness of serious games and infer the player learning outcomes for it. Um, uh, as we don't have a lot of time left, uh, we're going to go through this part a bit faster. Uh, just stop if you have any questions. Just stop us if you have any questions. Uh, so the concept of this paper is that they say that there's a watch with a widespread uh, use of online education and virtual learning environments. Uh, that leads to the increase in the amount of ed educational data and that then leads to the growth of learning analytics and educational data mining. Um, this uh, kind of uh, educational data mining and analytics can be used to better understand the underlying learning processes and this knowledge which is produced by these process can be used by different stakeholders with diverse purpose from university administrators calculating dropout rates in each class uh, to teacher identifying students at risk of uh, failing a subject or whatever. And why in, in situ data collection is mainly used in game analytics, questionnaire field by player, uh, if you remember what we said before, is X2 data collection is still the main method to assess the effect of serious game, according to Calderon and Ruiz in 2015. And from what they found out in another paper in 2015 is that the learning outcome is the result that most, uh, most stakeholders want to obtain from this serious game. And that proves there's a clear need to combine learning analytics and educational data mining with the in-situ data collection methods in game analytics to provide a more reliable, automated, and repeatable assessment for serious game. And in this methodology, they target two different phases in a serious game, the design and implementation phase, where a game design pattern is proposed to shape the delivery of the educational content throughout the game and the validation and deployment phase where an analysis is proposed to infer learning outcomes and game effectiveness. And now we go to the overview of the method. The goal is to ease the measurement of serious game by learn, serious game learning outcome and provide a systematic way to access the effectiveness of serious game as a whole. So if you can see from this uh, image, uh, we inject they inject the learning goal into the learning design phase, which means trans they transform the learning goals into game mechanics and learning outcome observables. And um, first, they in this this is the design implementation part. They target they have a target population characteristic, and also inject them into learning design. And by translating all of those into game mechanics and learning outcome observables, they then have the game design. And this game design is now fit to uh, 
Yeah, you, they use the scan design to design for a series game, and then they use this series game on a target population sample and express of that field to get a form, formative evaluation. So uh, in short, they give the target population sample and expert uh, test play to gather this uh, event that is emitted. And then they perform analysis based on the events and then have the, uh, and analyze them against the learning outcomes. And then they have the pre preliminary learning outcome assessment. If it fits their, if the game proves to be effective, they will go to the deployment phase. If it's not, then they go back to the design implementation phase to improve the game design. And in the deployment phase, they give the game to the target population where they produce the final evaluation based on the um, event that is emitted uh, within the game. And then they do the analyze, analysis on the learning outcome, which then produce the final learning outcome assessment for the game. Um, so in the design and method implementation, they design, uh, they propose a pattern is to split the game into three phase strategy phase. This is the, the phase where the player are first introduced to the learning goal. And this, uh, this can include knowledge uh, procedure that they might need in subsequent step. Uh, also the concrete instruction on how to interact with the game world. Uh, so simply say it's a game tutorial in general. Um, and also in this phase, the user start to form a strategy in order to tackle the problem that they're going to face in um, later stage. And in the practice phase, the players start to apply what they what they learn from the strategy phase and test those uh, knowledge. In this phase, um, this, this practice phase must occur in a game environment where players' mistakes have either no consequences at all or a very mildly adverse consequences. Uh, this phase provides a user a safe environment in order to test their knowledge. And this phase uh, will produce an initial observable, which can tell us uh, where the user is at the beginning of the, say, the, the game. Uh, the level of knowledge, what they know already and what they didn't know in the beginning of this uh, of the game. And they also, they have, finally, they have a master phase where the, the players are required to prove that they have acquired the intended knowledge facing challenges similar to those presented in the practice phase, but with increasing difficulty and greater in-game consequences for example, they can die in that in the game or lose a lot of score, for example. And in this phase, the player proves the degree to which they have acquired the intended skill or knowledge. And uh, with this uh, final observable that we collected from the mastery phase, we can measure the, the final process towards the learning goal. And these three phases can be iterated over and over to deliver multiple learning goals or to deliver a single goal with increasing difficulties, adding a new related concept or skill in each cycle. And um, additionally, this game optimized the time where the player, uh, the player in the flow zone, since it's alternate moment between uh, between player learning new things in a safe environment, which is the practice phase, which moment where they are challenged to build a skill is in a mastery phase. All this with an incremental approach to avoid frustration for the player. And there are some basic principles that have defined the observable that are supposed to be collected within the game. So observable data should be a timestamp event representing simple interaction of the player within the game. And this event will be sent to a central server where all the player interaction will be stored for later access and analysis. Uh, events sent to server should be raw interaction instead of just opaque score, meaning it should be every attempt the user tries to solve the problem instead of just the final score of the player within the phase, then it, just, it doesn't prove anything. We need to see the player process where they 
where they are learning the thing. And finally, that data collection process should be as non-disruptive during gameplay as possible in order to not uh, break the user learning process. Um, learning outcome analysis. So we're, how are they doing this? They doing it by using assessment point from practice and mastery phase. The interaction from the strategy phase are not used in inferring learning outcome because that, that, that's the only the part where the user just got introduced to the learning outcomes, uh, a learning goal. So there's nothing to see there. Uh, in the initial assessment, they use the initial observables from the practice phase and this gives estimate the learn, learner's initial degree of knowledge, meaning what they uh, what knowledge do they possess before starting to play? The high value would indicate that the player already knows this thing before they, they play the game, and while a low value would mean the opposite. And the final assessment is collected from the mastery phase is to estimate the learning outcome. A high value would indicate that the player success in the learning goal, while a low value would indicate that they were failed. And we also defined um, initial threshold and final threshold to measure this uh, assessment mentioned above in order to determine if a phase is successfully accomplished or not. Okay, so what about serious game with multiple learning outcomes? We can calculate learn the global initial assessment and final assessment using a weight average combining result from each learning goal. And then we define the threshold uh, in the same way, basically. So for example, for given a game with uh, two educational goals, for example, and each with two assessment, initial assessment and final assessment, and then two threshold. And for example, if we give the first one a weight of 0.4 and the second one a weight of 0.6, then you can see how we just sum everything and then divide the weight, the sum of the weight, if you understand the formula. Uh, I was just planning to write it down on the board for you, but uh, I guess we're not doing this soon, we're running out of time. And um, with inferring, now that we have the, um, <coughs> the assessment from the game, then we can go ahead and infer the learning outcomes. The final assessment is the final score of the player. We avoid using initial uh, assessment because the initial assessment include a mistake the user makes in the practice phase where they are allowed to without any consequences. So it should not be used in the final assessment. Um, measure, and then we can measure the effectiveness by comparing initial assessment and final assessment to their respective threshold. And the difference between accomplishment in the practice and mastery phase will indicate uh, no risk gain for the player. Ah, uh, well, did they not learn anything? Then we'll see. And how do we compare this? So if we look at this, if the final assessment is larger or equal to the final threshold, and then we uh, look at the uh, initial assessment versus the initial threshold. If it's, uh, the initial assessment is smaller than the initial threshold, then the user type is the learner. And a learner is that the player committed error during the practice phase indicated, indicate that they did not possess the skill or knowledge before playing the game. However, they ended up being successful in the master phase, which means there's an the educational game during the gameplay. And if the initial assessment is larger or equal to the initial threshold, it means that the player did not commit uh, or not commit as much error in the practice phase, indicating that they are probably already possess the skill and knowledge before playing. And if the final assessment is smaller than the final threshold, which means the player failed, then we look at the initial assessment, if it is smaller than the threshold, then the user type is non-learner, which means that the player failed during the practice phase and also failed in the uh, mastery phase, which means they struggle throughout the game potentially with little or no benefit at all. 
And if the initial assessment is not equal to the initial threshold, it means that the play is success during the practice phase, but we're unable to apply the acquired knowledge in the mastery phase, which means that there is some flaw in the game design uh, where we translate the learning outcomes into game mechanics. There's some flaw in there, which is why this, this kind of uh, player is produced uh, as I said here, the, um, any major retail of user time will have indicate the effectiveness of the game. If the major retail were learner, then the game was highly effective, and most players learn something while playing it. If the majority were master, then the game produced no learning effect, since most players already uh, know the thing before playing. If the majority was non-learner, the game was not effective at all, since most players were unable to success in any in any phase and finally a major alliers in the case of the game and other chosen final assessment and initial assessment formula probably have some design flaw in them. And now we go to the case study uh, performed by the authors in order to apply their methods. Yes, so um, for the case study, the, the authors uh, decided to analyze a game called The Foolish Lady, which is a game designed to teach children about the Spanish golden century uh, poetry. And uh, like mentioned before, uh, the game is split into three parts. The strategy where player learns about the rule sets, uh, practice where they can safely uh, employ or to test their existing knowledge, and then the mastery phase where, uh, where uh, the, different, uh, the different tasks are a bit more demanding and uh, uh, testing of the user. Um, so for the case study, there was two uh, research questions. Uh, what are the implications of using our game design pattern during the design and implementation of a serious game? and what results regarding learning outcomes and effectiveness can be obtained from a serious game development analyze with this methodology. Uh, next slide. Um, so those, are, those were the generic uh, questions, but for this specific case uh, study, they developed two questions. Uh, First is whether or not uh, the student possessed the intended skill at the end of the Foolish Lady, or uh, if there were any differences between the groups given the demographic var variables. Uh, question two, uh, is the Foolish Lady game effective at teaching its intended skill to our population given our demographic variables or the differences between groups? Um, these case study questions were made in order to allow the researchers to confirm or deny whether or not their methodology um, worked and was applied correctly. Um, and for the case study, there was 320 high school students from eight different schools in Madrid, 44.4% uh, female and the rest male. Uh, the mean age range was 13.7, so uh, uh, give or take uh, 1.27 years. Um, and overall, it was a representative sample of the population. Uh, next. Yes, so this is just a quick overview of how the different um, Scores are calculated. Uh, you'll have to forgive the scaling on the image because uh, uh, those images are supposed to be on the RG equals and FG equals, um, but there seems to be something wrong here. Um, but it's not necessarily too important for uh, this presentation right now, but it just uh, shows that there is a score between zero and one, which effectively is the grade of the user. Um, in the Redondilla game, which is the practice round where the student develops their initial score, um, 
it's a system where the user gains points every time they score rates, uh, where the highest score is a one if they get it on the first try. Um, and the other two scores for, uh, work on a system where it removes a point for every time you get it wrong. And uh, so for the second to last equation, you can see the four there, that is the number of questions. Um, uh, and since uh, the Redondilla puzzle is the only, uh, the only initial, uh, I've got the IA, what that means, but um, that is the only practice phase. And uh, at the bottom, you can see the final equation, which just means that um, the different mastery phases were weighted uh, equally. Um, next slide. Um, so this is just a uh, breakdown of the uh, the results. So here we can see that uh, the students who attended uh, um, or the eligible data points was uh, 288. That's because there was a few corrupted data points, whether it's uh, technical problems or anything like that. And uh, towards the end, there was only 231% of which completed the final phase. Of these, 68% um, uh, got above the adequacy threshold, which is um, the grade which was set, or the passing grade which was set during the game design, uh, where the grade is between zero and one. Um, yeah, next slide. And here we see the different types of analysis towards the end. Um, uh, as shown here, there is a statistical uh, significance between the gender and game uh, habits in the uh, initial assessment, uh, as shown by the less than 0 0.05 uh, PE score for both uh, gender and game habits. And uh, similarly, for the uh, the final assessment score, um, uh, there was uh, statistical significance between the groups uh, of uh, age and game habits, as shown by the p-value. Um, and uh, yeah, hold on. Um, so here we can see that uh, the end result essentially. Um, in all age groups, the outliers were higher than the amount of masters, which uh, 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 which is uh, not correct. I meant to type the other way around. Um, uh, what I meant to uh, say is that the amount of masters is higher than the amount of outliers, except in the 16 year old group. Uh, no, wait, the amount of non learners is lower than the amount of outliers, which is not a very good uh, uh, thing. It shows that there might be some fault in the learning design, um, apparently with the exception of the 16 year old group. And there were also some irregularities within the 14 year old uh, group, which uh, shows that there was an exceptionally high amount of uh, masters uh, in that group, which can, uh, in our opinion, either be attributed to some missing data clarification that Perhaps uh, this is the time where they learn about uh, uh, poetry and thus it's a bit more fresh in their memory. Or perhaps it's mishandled data collection. So um, those maybe a group of children uh, 
did not or wasn't supervised properly so maybe there was some cooperation between them which then uh, made that there was a higher amount of casters um, similarly as you can see in the, uh, the game habits uh, there seems to be a clear indication of uh, people who play games scoring higher on this test than the ones that don't play any games Next. So uh, uh, there are some discussions about uh, topics raised by the, the article. So the question is like, uh, did the students uh, possess the intended skill at the end of the foolish lady game? So the answer would be yes, because 80.2% could finish the game, which required by design a basic understanding of the principles of the learning goal. So the other question is, can Given our demographic variables, were there differences between groups? And yeah, there are today they made two clusterizations, and one by age, you could see that 12 and 13 had the eight years old had the lowest values of um, adjusted uh, mean, and at the age of 16, they had the highest value of uh, adjusted mean. Um, by if you clusterize by game habits, you can see that well round games that are those that have some variable game styles uh, experience. They had a adjusted mean, adjusted mean of uh, higher than the closely followed uh, than the hardcore games gamers. Um, so the other question they raise is, 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 is the game effective uh, as teaching, at teaching its intended skill or to our population? And the answer is no, because the most of, of, the, of them were categorized as masters. And this could mean that it was too easy for most players or, or it, was, it had a design flaw. Uh, they, they had some short sessions made by by a sh and cons that consists with a sh really short uh, practice phase. So students playing this game enjoyed other benefits. Uh, that's a good point, like uh, such such as measurable increase in their motivation to to the to the t t theater. And given our demographic variables, were they were there differences between groups, uh, segmenting groups by age and game habits? There were no uh, particular group in which the game was more effective. Okay, next. So, uh, what are the implications of using our game design portal during the design, design and implementation of a serious game? You can define a clear learning goal from the beginning and stick to it during the game development process. The process, the process is, is guided by the proposed game design project. And the mini, the mini games had, had in their resolution uh, clear as, aspects in the assessment, making it easier to assess. Next one. So, uh, what results re regarding learning outcome and effectiveness? can be obtained from a serious game development and analyze it with our methodology. Uh, if you identify relevant uh, educa educational observables during the game design, you'll simplify the task of calculating learning outcome and game effectiveness. If you use serious game into an assessment tool, the assessment process and learning outcome are more clear. And it, it, it can be used with uh, external data, data like demographic data, to get more conclusions. And, and as a key of the assessment process, we, we can also uh, determine if students actually learn playing the game. Uh, they, they also concluded that the number of outliers indicate the design flaw in the practice phase. So, so you could take care the training phase, so we should take care of the training phase as well. Can you read the next one? So, conclusion uh, the game provi provided pr proves 
to be an effective assess assessment tool, uh, however, assessment tool, whoever, whoever, it was unable to fully capture the initial knowledge of, of the students. Uh, they concluded that good design and balance of the practice phase is the key to implement an effective serious game. The implementation structure is going to be used as main infrastructure to assess games. Uh, they were using the RAGE European project. Uh, okay. And could, could be applied to any serious game whose goal can be measured, but me measured in a quantitative way. Next one. Once the game starts sending observables events, uh, everything is automated and all assessments is, are, are made on how learners interact with the game, which is a good aspect. And as future work, they, they want to enrich their game design pattern with more observables in all phases, like time spent in each phase. And some important questions for the future of serious game analytics were raised, like, uh, uh, what standards sh should be used in the communication and what visualization should be pro provided to differences, differentiate stakeholders. And that's it. Yep. Any thoughts? So, thank you very much. Any thoughts? This was a long one. That was a long one indeed. Um, whereas the paper presentation wasn't as long as the previous one, so it's eight into that time. Does anyone have clarification questions or the like? Or comments? Um, so um, in, in terms of the, I mean, just, yeah, so so the, the, the initial presentation, eight billion in our discussion point, uh, just as a reflection on the second uh, presentation briefly, um, bef before I get into some concrete points, is um, it, it be, be careful um, just repeating the entire content of the paper, right? So it, would be, it should be a bit more of an extract of it, because we assume that most of us have read the paper, so, and I felt myself reminded of the uh, 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 actually actual text from the paper. So sometimes it's good to reduce it to bullet points that more, 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 essential highlights essentially highlight the, the 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 lessons learned from a particular paper but um looking at a paper what's what's your thought about this more generally anyone really well, we discussed this um among us and we thought the method is very well written and it's very detailed but um there was kind of a lot of flaws during the case study phase uh, for example, they make the mistake to not include the sample population, a sample of the target population in the uh, validation phase. So that's why it leads to the the final result not being very helpful, I guess, because there was the design flaw, because there's a lot of outliers and such. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but but um, uh, do you recognize some? methodological challenges if you uh, uh so as you say the method is quite interesting intriguing and kind of makes sense at least at face value um, um how does it relate i mean in order to do that properly what would they need to do you you pointed to some shortcomings but more more generally what uh, uh it would need to be done properly well they, they, they said, well, we need to know our research objective or learning objective from the get-go, right? So mm -hmm. that's, I think, something got quite well, uh, managed quite well. The, the other challenge is really finding out the, the learning audience or the target audience. And uh, to, to, some, to some extent, um, I would suggest that it's, um, if, you know, if you look at the um, approach uh, in figure two, how would you know i mean really if you if you design a game ex ante um how would you actually know the target audience unless you actually played with an audience right what they in fact the way the way i read the paper is that they have a really nice idea and they presented basically a pilot as far as i'm concerned because what they're missing is the next iteration of actually uh, honing in on the particular target audience but but more importantly uh, weeding out the problems in their game design and because as far as I read it, they're not even concrete about the problems. Um, so they say, yeah, you know, they have a mechanism or metric of identifying the, the, the flaws in the game, outliers they call them. 
but where is yeah, this coming where this is coming from is not assessed and there's also no it seems qualitative assessment because they just you know collected the in-game measures that brings me to the next point what is um they're making a big 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 point about uh, non-disruptive data collection um and i'm not convinced that this is necessarily the appropriate way in this particular uh, way uh, in this particular case is that, do you have any thoughts on this one yeah, yeah, I think they perform this kind of case study within a lab in the school that they perform the thing. So I'm not sure if there's most certainly will be some disruptive, there will be some distraction like uh, discussion among friends and such. Mm. And then the way they, uh, they don't really reveal how they actually um, control the group that they were testing. All right. Uh, for example, the there was like a highly, uh, very high number of master during the 14 years, years uh, age, age of group and compared to the other group. And they don't really uh, provide a solid reason to how this comes to light. And also they mentioned that they have some uh, exit to questionnaires after the, the, the players finished playing the games as well. And they don't really, um, disclose this appendix because I can't mm. really find them anywhere. And uh, they don't really disclose the results of those after game question as well. So, yeah. yeah. That's a very good point you're making because I think that um, would be the, the, there's where the essential learning is, right? So all their objectives, okay, is that is that game a good game for facilitating uh, learning and so on in the context is, is sensible. But uh, uh, providing those resources, I think in the qualitative responses, there would have been quite some insights that would have led to clearly identifying the flaws in game design or shortcomings in the metrics they apply, because we don't even know whether the metrics are in all cases sensible. Um, operating on the delta between the initial training phase and the uh, final phase is sensible. But for example, uh, what, what, part of the reason that many of them are masters is what if the, 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 the practice phase already leads to mastery, right? The, 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 they, they're intending to capture two snapshots. Um, one of them is um, the performance at the practice stage, the minor introduction, and at the mastery stage after actually playing the game. What happens if the game is so oddly designed that mastery can be reached in the practice phase. In this case, there's of course no delta, no difference uh, between practice and mastery phase. Therefore, as far as they are concerned, students wouldn't have learned anything. But uh, conversely, they may well have learned, uh, uh, um, you know, everything literally in the practice phase. So that's a bit of a flaw that I would see in this this, this particular design, or at least they should discuss uh, what the implication for the practice for, uh, phase would be more explicitly, other than make it shorter or longer. Yeah, they, but I, I think they did mention that the practice phase in the game was quite short. But uh, yeah. do you want to say anything, Andrew? Andrew? Uh, yeah, yeah. Like they say the opposite, but maybe it would be bad if you if you expand the practice phase, as you Correct. said. Yeah, exactly. But they only argue uh, argue based on time, which is which is probably quite you know uh, one sense of a parameter, but probably not the only one. Uh, you know, what, what are components, what should you, so how do you ensure that you don't train people up in the practice phase, however long or short it is, to an extent that there's no, that they can reach mastery already, right? You need to control this somewhat, right? It's the, you don't want to make this a learning process in its own right, to some extent. That's that's the the, the, the challenge I see a bit in, in this methodology, and I don't see an answer as to how they want to attack this, or I wouldn't, Perhaps you have some ideas how this could be attacked, possibly. I, but uh, that seems to be a um, question that is not really answered as part of the paper, the way I see. Are there any other thoughts about of the ones that are still here? And there are. And still, still, uh, well, if you if you look at the figure two, I think it's uh, it's kind of similar to what you find in sports. I mean, how to how to master certain skills. So you first have to. Uh, uh, see what you're going to do, then you need to practice to get the basic skills, and then you refine. It's not mastery, you refine, and uh, and you have added the increased difficulty. But I think one important part of the mastery is not just to uh, increase difficulty, it's also to provide variations. So you need mm -hmm. to show your skills in a variety setting. So, so because in, in practice, you get to learn the basics, and then you need to apply it for many different uh, situations, and they may not be different in in terms of difficulty but they may be quite different in terms of, of uh, what to consider and how to approach it so it may not be 
harder or easier, but they are different. And, and that mm. the variation, and that's how you typically acquire mastery is that you apply your skill in many different settings and, and you are able to recognize and, 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 and apply it still. Yeah, I would really like to see this method getting applied into some kind of training games. Uh, we were actually having a discussion to uh, tell us if whether this game, the Foolish Lady game, is actually like a message broadcaster rather than a training game itself. Uh, to me, I think it was kind of a message broadcaster because it's uh, just teach the, the 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 phrasing thing in hmm. Spanish, I think. Uh, and it's just kind of like broadcast the thing one way and then let the user practice to get points. Uh, so uh, there's possible chance that like after the game, the users might forget the whole thing was the redundilla uh, thing is well, uh, whatever it is. So to me, it was kind of like a message broadcaster, but I think Hakun uh, didn't think it was a message broadcaster. You want to talk about it, Hakun? Uh, yeah, personally, I don't think it was a message broadcaster because it did feature uh, an assessment component. And uh, uh, I just think that the main problem was that it lacked quite a bit of game design in that the granularity of the mastery phase was not very fine. It was just uh, like two steps, I believe. Um, whereas if there was a bit more of a gradual curve, uh, in addition to some scaffolding, it could uh, allow for the researchers to gather more data points to get a more detailed view on uh, on the, whether or not it's successful or not. And at the same time, I do kind of feel like um, perhaps the the task that the user is presented with is uh, a bit easy for them, considering that the vast majority of users were I either masters or learners. Uh, so uh, I do think that if the difficulty had been raised a bit, it could help um, even out the masters into more categories so learners or perhaps uh, non-learners but um, it might uh, give us a chance to better see if this method works or not but i think they failed at that to a certain degree at least well, I have another comment there, and I think Christopher was leading up to it, saying that uh, uh, they didn't test it very closely with students and with teachers. I think this is a major thing here. I mean, if you, uh, if if one of us is teaching, uh, like I'm teaching a database course, I know pretty much what I should expect uh, at the A, B, C, D, E level. Uh, and that has, I've, I've acquired that knowledge through many, many, many students, many, many exams. And, and if we are to develop serious games, I don't think we're going to have the levels for the thresholds or the levels for, uh, for any of these measures correct, or the, even the tests, even in the training or in the uh, uh, end of the two, two stages of, the, uh, of their model, uh, other through a huge number of trials. I mean, a huge number of students going through this and a number of teachers going through and adjusting the levels and adjusting the questions and adjusting the challenge levels. So, so I think to get to this point where we know that it's a good measuring instrument, I think we have a lot, many, many more, a lot more uh, iterations and many, many more students and teachers involved to get to that level. And I think that this is where analytics comes in play. So now in introductory programming, there are so many tools out there and so many serious games or, or just uh, programming, um, uh, what do you say, tests and, and uh, optimized testing and, uh, and assessment tools. And these are starting to becoming quite good in that they have so huge numbers of students passing them and you know what to expect from a, from a beginner. You know what to expect after uh, for the average student after tens of hours of training and you know what to expect as the final uh, 
uh, level. But I think that this is the problem with, with these games that we see in, in, in the research setting is that they are developed once and you have a group of 30, 40, 100, 200 students and it's just one try. And, and, and it's very unlikely that we're going to find the right point on any of these uh, thresholds or, or even the, the types of questions we are asking. Mm. Yes, that's a good point because like there's the learner initial knowledge might already be different within the sample within the, the class because uh, I think your the the database class was like a few hundred students around uh, 150. Yeah, that's quite a lot. And if we use this, uh, there might be a clear gap between different students. I think different group of students. But even if you use a database class as, the, as an example, I wouldn't know what would be proper uh, uh, games, what would be pro proper level of games, what would need more or less training, what would be the proper test questions to see if they have yeah. certain skills until I've done it a few times with a few cohorts of students. That, that's what I'm saying. So I think we have to be patient here and, and can't expect uh, mm -hmm. to have quick, <laughs> quick answers whether a, a process or an approach works or not because we need yeah. to refine it and as well. Yeah, I think this is a time consuming process, but at the same time they have, they do have that validation part where they have a sample target population as well as the experts like yourself into the game to see what could be improved. But yeah, I agree that this should be very time consuming. I mean, I mean a simple fix would be to say, hey, just run i mean if the uh, honest are really the authors are really honest about what they want to do they could just run this again right so now they have learned find the target audience and simply run this exercise in an extended or different setting again so anyway um absolutely but i think what they need to do then is to try to go beyond the quantitative data they need yeah, absolutely, to the absolutely. Quality parts to see 100 percent Exactly. What what was the where did we miss? Where were the levels too low exactly. before? Or were they have too little practice time? Or what sure. is it? So, I mean, that, that, absolutely right. But uh, in, in in any case, it already hones in at least on the target audience, in irrespective of further design challenges, right? So I think method their methodology needs to be an iterative one uh, that they imply, but actually not live uh, up to. Um, so I think Bjorn, I had a comment before, at least he virtually raised his hand. Is that um, still applicable? Sorry for spotting that too late. Um, yeah, that was for the, the first article uh, regarding or the assessment in game-based learning. Uh, and just a quick thought uh, might still be relevant in that um, uh, in uh, the figure on um, what makes an entertainment game, uh, message broadcasting, or an actual serious game. Uh, I find it quite uh, or interesting that there are so few games that have, that can be actually called a serious game, uh, or an actual serious games, and not just a message and broadcasting. Uh, when you add uh, figure two, was it? Oh, you mean uh, look the 90% uh, message broadcaster and 10% game for... Yes, when you also look at the, the figure three in the same uh, paper that has uh, a very small area of um, uh, entertainment, uh, uh, entertainment and uh, human performance improvement uh, graph. And, and which uh, or where the three categories fall, uh, are separated from each other, and that well, it's, uh, well, it's some it's uh, from a separate paper. Uh, I I think I try to look into it, but I think it's actually not free. I mean, the full text is not free. I have to request it, so <laughs> yeah, there's no uh, really uh, any information on it okay. uh, unless you go want to deep deep uh, deep deeper into it. But it was a. Um, more or less quick observation uh, that may be because they, they don't seem to align very well in in the way or well maybe oh, anyway that's for me so uh ah, charlotte has a comment i believe charlotte you want to say anything Yeah, I just have one question. 
Uh, I want to know how they assess the, their scores in the in the press testing phase because uh, it says they can try as many times as they want in the practicing uh, stage. So do they just calculate the time they need to practice and also the accuracy? Because it's not uh, clarifying the paper. Uh, um, I think there was a point uh, calculated every time the user tried to make an attempt uh, uh, within the practice phase and I don't actually because well they don't really say deep into how they collect the data actually they just say it's timestamp event uh, with every attempt that the user make uh, trying to solve the problem and I believe the problem was kind of like a, a poem with three blank uh, points you know that's for to fill in the, the to fill in the, the, the blank and there was quite a few options and if I remember correctly there was five options oh, and there was five blank spots and then uh, there was kind of like a few combination that the user can use to fill in those spots and I think they um, every time the user fill in one they will capture that and then uh, they will assign some kind of score to it in a later date and there was approximately around 120 possible combination from there and I think they can calculate some kind of point based on those uh, average I guess I don't know if it's clear but uh, I don't have too much detail as well because well, they don't really mention it did they okay because it's very like you can you can try to um infer how they measure the their score in the mastery stage because you, you can only try once and then you can calculate the accuracy but the practice stage is very unsure unclear yeah i think they should have well clearly go deeper they should go deeper into the practice phase of the game as well yeah thank you well, so I, uh, I have a couple of, uh, of uh, I don't know, questions to their design or whatever thinking, so or or uh, weaknesses, uh, depending on how you look at it. But so when they go to uh, participants, so in the serious games for education, you would think there's a big difference of what you can expect from a 12-year-old versus a 16-year-old. So I'm not discussing this, uh, what the differences with age group and, and well, how well were these objectives aligned with uh, objectives that the kids have at that age or the students have at that age. Uh, so uh, um, so it, it's, it's kind of a strange design that goes so broadly in age groups uh, and because most likely the learning outcomes here would, would fit probably one or two age groups. Uh, uh, a span of two years rather than uh, five years. Uh, and the other thing is, as we pointed out already, is this 14-year-old, uh, 63 uh, students being masters and not even discussing it. What could the reasons be? They don't, uh, as far as I can see, they don't discuss it at all other than just recognize it. That, oh, well, this is, this is a high number here. <laughs> and then they go on. <laughs> yeah, we actually discussed it among ourselves, and um, the reason we there was some uh, reason that we believe is that like uh, the 12 and 13 years old are still too young to the concept, and it might prove to be too difficult for them to grasp at that time. So, which is why they didn't have much uh, input. I mean, they didn't learn much from it, but. Uh, for the, it's different for the 14, 15, and 16 because they actually more mature. And it's actually happened to me as well because sometimes they look at something and didn't understand it at the time. But after one or two years, I look at it again. It uh, seems to be quite simple to grasp. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's a clear development uh, somewhere between the 12 and 13 compared to the rest of the groups. But, um, uh, they don't really discuss much about how the 14 years old got such a high score. Uh, we have some theories that 
like um, the somehow the concept is actually uh, they the fourteen year old. I actually I get to practice this concept a lot during that year, that school, uh, that school year compared to the fifteen and sixteen years old who's already uh, moved past the concept and uh, like maybe forget some of it already. And Andre, you want to say something? Oh yeah. Um... Just, just so, so see if I got this right, you, Rune. So you were saying that, uh, that there is a design flaw, like there is some such a difference by age that uh, that should be designed for should be a game design for each kind of group. Is that what you mean? I I would think so. I mean, uh, if you think about math or natural sciences, you you expect students to progress through these years. Mm -hmm. So if you make a game for a twelve-year-old, it will be looked very different from a sixteen-year-old. Even if the concepts were the same in physics, I mean, you will have some of the same concepts, but you would expect them to master them at a very different level and and be more challenging. So you would think that. Uh, Lyrics will be the same thing, uh, or just language skills will mean that a 16-year-old is able to, to do uh, the analysis in a very different way from a 12-year-old. And having uh, the same game for the whole age group and expect kind of that game to be optimal for all, I think that is a, that is a flaw. And, and then not discussing this and, and arguing why it makes sense or what are the cautions we need to take when looking at the results because of this, these differences. Uh, that, that's worrying when they don't see that this might be a problem. I see. I see your point. I, I feel like maybe they, they did only one design because if they made different designs, it would be hard to compare them it would maybe fall into the media comparison because they would be so different. I, I understand, I understand your point that they are, the groups are very different, but I, I also see that maybe if they created a different design um, for each group, it would be hard to compare them. Yeah, but why compare apples and pears in the first place? So they are already clustering them and discussing within the cluster. So, so I, I think it depends on what they would like to verify or prove. If they would like to verify their uh, figure two, where you have the the three steps and verify that that makes sense, then that should be optimal for each age group. And then they could show that, okay, there are actually, for all of these, we can see there are more learners than masters for all, all four or five years. That would be much better, I think, than saying now, like, we can't really see anything because we have an average of, of different things. Mm -hmm. I see. But, may, uh, yeah. but maybe they did that also, because they want to see which target is the target audience that would have best effect like oh this game is really good for it it would be good if they if they discuss it then, but uh, but I think exactly. in general, I think in general, as as uh, Christopher was saying, they should have designed this much closer with the teachers and and the target audience in the first place to to make sure that it was the right level. I agree. Okay. Any other comments? I recognize we are running well into our third hour of uh, serious <laughs> games. So uh, I'm excited to see that there are still 19 participants. So that's really good. So um, in, in, in interesting times. Um, are there any other comments with respect to this particular challenge? Oh, uh, while, while people are contemplating, uh, I think uh, it would be uh, really good for you guys um, who actually made the presentation right now and so on to really discuss this issue um, that, that Runa came, uh, uh, came up with. And, and fundamentally, the challenge seems to be, you know, in how far uh, does um, target audience play a role? In how far can metrics be generalized? And which aspects are specific, right? So the only general aspect that in that paper that I see in terms of metrics or analysis in particular is that they point to the uh, fact that for whatever reason, data needs to be non-disruptive, data collection, um, that the server should get raw data and it should be timestamped uh, rather. So that, that seems like a very infrastructural concern. I'm wondering if there's more higher level uh, um, aspects that are worthwhile considering in a design aspect. Are there, because what I mostly take away from this, and in this slide, both Paris, uh, papers that you presented actually correspond quite well, is that if we talk about game design, we have those generalizable patterns. When we talk about serious game design, it's next to impossible to find those. Uh, and my challenge to you would be to see if you can 
in your in your overview to cluster some of those uh, metrics as they may apply you know as i mentioned before to different industries or across them right so uh, in addition to to uh, be, being mindful of aspects such as uh, target user group and so on but I'm, I'm not sure if there's anything there but it would be interesting to to um, crystallize this um, out and then kind of um, present this a bit more um, any other questions or comments by anyone good um, just, just one yep. final meta comment i mean the yep. fact that everybody's here i i think it might be because this is uh, uh, kind of filling a social void now that we can't meet in campus so, so maybe talking to someone at least digitally <laughs> is a good thing is it is it that bad come on i mean i don't know uh, I don't know, but uh, more generally, does that tool work, right? So do we need to consider another tool or do, do other people, do some people have experience with other tools that they deem more suitable to, to you know, hold those sessions? We are, I think Aaron and I are inherently indifferent about this. It's just more an explorative exercise that we're entertaining right now, so. And uh, we're gonna try it again tomorrow in the integration project, I believe, right. unless the same. we get strong, strong- uh, Pushback. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Cool. Well, then yeah, it's probably you know, next an opportunity to follow up there and see you know, how far the different format makes. Uh, and, and, and as we were just saying about the games, uh, we, we're going to learn more about this tool <laughs> as well. So we're going to be better at it in a while. That's right. Cool. Um, I think it's timely to conclude the meeting. Um, all ah, right. Yeah. So uh, there's some yeah something we need to yeah work on is the moderation a bit. So be paying a bit more attention to your respective uh, signs and so on. Um, that is something we probably should uh, redo. Um, I also have the impression that we have more like a batch in approach right now. So, um, the, um, but um, for now, uh, let's leave it at this. We uh, probably we, we reconvene next week, and um, Runa can explore how far this tool works tomorrow. You and together with Runa can do so. And then we see um, the other group. Um, the respective group that presents next week, um, just ensure that you start preparing your, your paper and uh, get in touch with me. So perhaps to discuss the um, specific paper that you would like to, uh, like everyone to read. That's pretty much it from my side. Um, good. As far as I'm concerned, I think we're good. And then we see each other next week. Okay. Yeah? Well, I don't think we yeah. saw so many, but at least we can hear there. <laughs> Well, here, okay, sure. Yeah. Yes. We, we can mandate the use of video, then we can manage the other aspect as well. well but anyway, know. if you want to abuse the bandwidth these days, so maybe That's not. right, that's right. That's a very sensible point Runa's making. We need to be mindful of bandwidth that can make a difference between somebody able being able to join and not. So that's a very sensible choice. Yeah, good. Okay. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.